camera has been a long time coming, so much so that even last year I made a wish list of what I would want from the successor to the X-H1. A brand new sensor and processor with a leap in performance, improved ports and accessibility features, competitive video features to make this more of a contender in the marketplace, and some cinema-centric features that will, you know, appease some professionals. You throw in a free square and that is B-I-N-G-O, bingo folks. And look, it might not nail every single one of these things, but there's no doubting that Fujifilm has thrown everything they could at this camera. I was lucky enough to learn about this camera back in March and we got our hands on very early and we've been using it across multiple situations, whether it was in wildlife, outdoors, at a concert, at a wedding, at a fake wedding, at, at a studio shoot, at a commercial shoot, and throughout all of this, we've come to learn a lot about this camera. I should say, this is not a review. There are no reviews that should be available right now because as Fujifilm has communicated to us, there are only pre-production units in the wild right now. That being said, I'm very optimistic at where Fujifilm can take this thing. And it should come as a surprise to no one if this ends up being one of the best video mirrorless solutions in the market and one that might be hard to find on store shelves. After nearly five years, half a decade, Fujifilm has introduced a brand new stacked CMOS backside illuminated X-Trans V sensor, their fifth generation sensor. And along with it comes a fifth generation processor as well. While this sensor is still a 26 megapixel sensor, the stacked array will allow this to be far more accurate in the field. For example, it'll reduce rolling shutter by three to four times. And we found that to be the case when we were using this for photo and video. The upgrade to a fifth generation processor really introduces a ton of new features like ProRes recording internally, high efficiency JPEG capture, and a new AI processing unit for more accurate autofocus. It's not just new features, I really believe this processor introduces way more headroom for future upgrades to come. The viewfinder on this camera has been improved to a 5.76 million dot viewfinder with 120 frames per second refresh rate, and there's even a boost mode that'll go to 240. I'll be honest, I, I couldn't quite tell the difference between these two in the moment, it, it still just felt like looking through a window, this super high clarity window. It's, it's a great upgrade here, especially for those that are using the viewfinder often on their camera. Along with the SD UHS-2 card slot, you also have a CF Express Type B card slot. Finally, a new slot that will unlock higher bitrate recording that's required for ProRes and well, even the new 760 megabit recording for H.265 files. Looking at the ports, you have the mic, remote, headphone jack, USB-C that's now improved as well and here is the big one a full-size HDMI for nearly half a decade I've been talking about this get rid of the flimsy micro HDMI port and they have you have a full-size HDMI port on this camera look that's already a lot of upgrades and those are just some of the notable features let's dive a little bit deeper to see what else this camera can do on the full review of this camera where I'll have more of an opinion on these features and specs. Right now, I just want to share with you what we've been capturing and how it performed in the field and questions that I have for upcoming videos. The improved sensor and processor allow this camera to record at 6.2K up to 30P in an open gate format where it's reading out the entire sensor. And this has been useful for us where you can capture content and have a lot more latitude when you're editing in post, especially having that increased verticality uh, to the footage when you're making vertical content, it just gives you a bit more options where you're not forced to tilt your camera 90 degrees to capture a shot that you're looking for. What's more impressive to me is that you can record 10-bit 422 video internally now, as high as 720 megabits per second. And this 
this is a bit of a game changer because no longer do you require an external recorder to record at the highest bitrate video. When you lock in the right exposure, it just gives you a ton of space for post-production. So far, I am seeing an improvement in the dynamic range here, where especially along the luminous channels on the high and low end, there seems to be more to work with than compared to my X-T4. Fujifilm is marketing north of 12 stops of dynamic range when you're at the standard F-Log, which has a floor ISO of 640. And again, seems to have better dynamic range here than we did with the X-T4. There's also now F-Log 2, a new improved F-Log that should give you north of 14 stops of dynamic range. And here the floor ISO is at 1250. It's important to mention here that this is not a dual native ISO system. These are just two log formats that have a different floor ISO reading. In my testing, I found myself gravitating to the standard F-Log as usual. When I was using F-Log 2, it seemed like it could come in handy in, in darker environments. In environments where you can control the exposure, I found that this actually gave more noise. It introduces a little bit more grain that was harder to reduce. Some more testing is required and I'm eager to see what other people are testing and finding out. At least for how we're using it, it seems like the standard F-Log still might be the best way to go and just cranking up the bit rate to have as much useful information in these files. And if you want to skip the whole F-Log thing, you don't want to work with log formats, depending on which film simulation you use, you should be getting 12 to 14 stops of dynamic range. So for those of you that are a fan of Eterna and just want to shoot internally and, and get the exposure as close to the final product as possible, you're still gonna get a lot of dynamic range to work with. There's also the inclusion of raw recording. So if you have a compatible Blackmagic or Atomos recorder, you can plug in and externally record raw footage. You have to make sure you have the right cable, the right firmware, and the right recorder for this to work, but that option is now there. Moving back to what this camera can do, you can record 4K footage up to 120p. This is in the high speed mode. The standard capture is still 4K at 60p. So if you're doing 4K 120, you can expect to see a 1.3 crop and no audio being captured here. And for those wondering, when you are recording at 4K, there is oversampling being done, whether it's 120 or 60 or 24, what have you. Obviously in 6.2K recording, there is no oversampling being done because you're just recording every single pixel on the sensor. Now, while all these options are great, I should also mention that on a 128 gig card, recording at the highest bitrate in ProRes will give you about seven minutes of footage. If you are going to H.265 and depending on the size of the card and, and changing the bit rates, well, you'll get anywhere between 23 minutes and five hours. The fifth generation processor here also has a subprocessor dedicated to image stabilization from what we were told. And this promises up to seven stops of image stabilization in the field. What impressed me here though, is that it seems like there was an intentional upgrade to the stabilization for video where photo has always been great, but in the past, the video stabilization seemed to counteract your movements. Well, now we were shooting a ton of handheld footage and it felt like the camera was going along for the ride and not trying to fight these intentional movements. So that was great to see. Now let's talk about heating or more specifically cooling because there was a lot of noise and clickbait in the lead up to these announcements. And this is the problem when, you know, rumors trickle out without context because people start to get their, you know, knickers in a bunch. Uh, I think that's probably the most friendly way I can put it. This cooling pack is interesting. When I looked at it, I thought, man, is this going to be sort of a deal breaker for people? However, it doesn't require its own battery. You could screw it on the back and it draws power from the camera. If you had to use this all the time, I would be kind of disappointed as well. However, in the four weeks we've been using this and in the weeks to come, we're going to push this thing and we have pushed this thing, whether it was outdoor in hot LA weather, backstage at a concert, in the studio for hours at a time, in humid environments, at the zoo, what have you. I never had a situation where I needed to put the cooling pack on. I'm sure more people are going to be doing tests and getting temperature readings and I'd love to see those results. How I approach this was I would use this camera as I normally would whether it was 4K 120p, 6.2K, 4K 60, I would look to just use this camera and often capturing clips that range from one to 14 minutes in length, 
some voiceovers in studio in my office here that are 20 to 45 minutes in length and just wait and see to when this temperature warning would show up. When would I need to use the cooling pack? I haven't gotten it once. I haven't had a situation where I needed it. Now, when I was building out my cinema rig, I put the cooling pack there just because of how the rig is built, but that was in one situation because I only got my cinema cage from small rig a few days ago. Okay, I've gone on long enough about other things. Let's talk about autofocus. This is probably the most uh, important upgrade here. Fujifilm has considerably upgraded their autofocus system. When we first got the camera, there were issues with certain lenses, especially their newer lenses, but they released a firmware update that we all had to do. I did that update and this thing is impressive. It, it sticks to your subjects now. There is no more hesitation from what I'm seeing where it can lock into an eye, face, animals, birds, planes, trains, cars, and, and, and even bikes for that matter. I'll revisit this in an upcoming video and as well in the final review. If I had to compare this right now, looking at the Sonys and Canons of the world, it's right there. I, I think from a UI perspective, from what you see on the LCD, the Sony seems stickier where there is less of the flickering and jitteriness to it. But when it comes to the footage, the most important thing for me here is that it is in focus. It is no longer hunting and hesitating as to what to capture. This is a big deal for Fujifilm because even if it's not a major issue in the field and for most people that are using these tools, autofocus is a big marketing feature. It's something that's pretty easy to show off and, and flashy and a lot of YouTubers will talk about it. And so companies are forced to address this. I found in my testing, Fujifilm has addressed this in a considerable way. We're gonna continue testing it and I'll even make a dedicated video just about this in the weeks to come. When you dive into the menus, there are more surprises here. There is now a flickerless shutter speed recording option where you can actually capture at sub shutter speeds in a way where now if you have a bunch of hue lights and TVs and monitors, you're just not gonna get that flicker where you're trying to find that sweet balance for your video footage. I, this for me is incredibly useful. And I think a lot of people that are doing talking head YouTube stuff at home will appreciate this as well. You also have the option for proxy recording where if you are capturing ProRes, you can capture a proxy file internally. While this sounds good on paper, it, it befuddles me. I didn't think I was gonna use that word today. It befuddles me that this is only restricted to ProRes, which is like the highest file size. It would be nice to have an option where if you're recording H.265, probably because you're going to be doing longer clips that you can have a proxy of these files, you know, a file format that is typically harder to unpack and more intensive on machines. It'd be nice to have a proxy for this. I'm hoping, and that's why I'm going to mention it here before it ships out that Fujifilm can, can work on this and even just be a little bit more open in saying, Hey, these are the features we're shipping with today. These are some updates coming in the future. And along with that, proxy recording for H.265. Not holding my breath, but I'm just saying it out loud. Hey! Alright, so that's a lot of video stuff. Let's go to the photo side before people come at me with pitchforks and, and torches. Uh, this has been improved as well, but because it's so early and we don't have a true in-depth way to work with these raw files, I can't have too much of an opinion on the image quality yet. And that's what I'm most interested about anyway, because you have a new stack sensor. And I want to see how does this respond? Do we have more dynamic range in these files and how much can you push them? For now, what I'll tell you is that having 15 frames per second mechanical or 40 frames per second in the electronic shutter is great. And I think that a lot of action sports, wildlife photographers will appreciate that. Coming back to autofocus, it was great here as well. It was reliable, whether it was humans or animals, it can lock into the subject. And if I had multiple subjects, I can toggle between them using the joystick on the back. There's also the option for high efficiency image capture if you want to use this instead of JPEGs, you know, future proofing your files a little bit, but it does reduce compatibility if you are looking to share it between devices and even people. As you would have noticed, the LCD will flip out to the side all the way around. It's a 1.62 million dot LCD display with touchscreen capabilities. It seems like this touchscreen is the same 
may be better. It doesn't seem like there is a significant improvement to the touchscreen, at least in my opinion. It doesn't have that sort of smoothness of, of a smartphone display. I would have liked to see this upgrade come to these cameras, but you know, uh, when you can now touch to focus very accurately, especially while recording video, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take that. At the very minimum, I'll take that. Oh, and I got to talk about custom profiles because there's an upgrade here, at least from what I believe. You can now save more information in your custom profile. So you can make it so that it's a video or photo custom profile. And here you can also save more information such as bitrate and type recordings, as well as and I think Richie from Fuji X Weekly will appreciate this and, and fans of what he's doing in the film simulation place, it will now retain white balance information, something that I've been asking for, for for years now. So it was great to see that these custom profiles that you spend a lot of time working and building, they retain more information and you can make it video or photo centric. For those that are gonna be capturing a lot, you can get the vertical battery grip where you can put in two additional batteries, three in total. I found this incredibly useful where, you know, if we're going for a full day shoot, I can have three batteries, use it for the entire day, have plenty of juice left over, throw on a top handle and you have a very slick video BTS rig to capture everything that you're looking to capture. Am I, did I just do jazz hands? Ugh. This camera feels like a smaller X-H1. It's bigger than the X-S10, but it feels nice in the hand and it doesn't feel overwhelming in any way. There are more buttons now. You have a dedicated record button next to that feather shutter release mechanism. You also have this DSLR styling. There is no more of that retro styling of the X-T3 or X-T4. There is no sub dial to switch between photo and video mode. Instead, you have this mode dial to the left of the camera that gives you seven custom modes. I don't know why they, they force us to have the filter mode there. I feel like this can be, you know, given a much more useful option. That's my opinion. But having seven custom modes is pretty awesome. Still at the top, but to the right of the camera, you'll notice that there is a sub LCD to view your you know, critical settings. Looking at the command dials, and this might be a point of contention, you can no longer press in the command dials. I, I wish they didn't remove that feature. And from talking to Fujifilm, it seems like they did this so that there were no accidental presses, especially in video environments. I don't think that's a good enough reason. I think that this uh, was a step in the wrong direction. Looking at the back of the camera, you'll notice that there is this disc-based joystick similar to the GFX 100S, something that I particularly am not too much of a fan of. It does work, but sometimes it's very inaccurate, especially when you're out in the field. There is a D-pad there for people that were worried that Fujifilm might get rid of this. But more importantly, let's look at the ports. The port doors now open up with authority and they stay there. They don't just flap around. The HDMI one, it's that flimsy kind, but it seems to fold all the way down, you know, in a more submissive manner, making it easier to actually have all these ports going for whatever you're trying to capture. For whatever you're trying to capture. That's what I meant to say. And behind the LCD, you'll notice that little communication port for that cooling pack. Again, it's it's pretty ingenious how they made this thing. It just screws into place, no battery required, and it just works. And I don't think it's for everyone. I don't think everyone needs this, at least not right away. All right, let's talk about lenses. And before we get to the Fujifilm lenses, I gotta give a shout out to Siriu because we want to test out their anamorphic X-mount lens, the 24 millimeter f2.8. And well, the timing worked out great. And using it on a camera like this, with that 6.2K recording, having all that data, and using it with this lens, it made for some great results. We have to de-squeeze this footage in post. We can't do it in the camera. But having this as a, you know, cinematic option, as a creative option for what we're looking to capture, it felt really empowering. Now let's talk about the lenses that Fujifilm has announced. The first one, 18 to 120 f4.0 power zoom lens. This thing, you know, it doesn't have an aperture ring now. It has a zoom focus ring, it's weather sealed, and it is meant for photo and stills. 
even though there is no optical image stabilization in this lens, it worked phenomenally. And I used this between myself and my assistant and we just had a lot of fun with this lens where it made for a great BTS camera. Whether it was in bright environments or dark environments, it would focus accurately using it in conjunction with a camera like the X-H2S, which has amazing image stabilization. Well, you almost forgot that the lens doesn't have any built in. The focus breathing was minimal, almost absent at times. And it was something that surprised me. I thought that this would be more of a enthusiast to junior kind of lens. And it turns out even in professional environments, it really punched above its weight. And at 460 grams and you know smaller than a tall boy, um, a really impressive lens. And I have a feeling that this might be a lens that's gonna be hard to find on store shelves. So I'm hoping Fujifilm is making enough for this launch. This lens has the equivalent focal range of 27 to 183 millimeters, making it seem more versatile than the 16 to 55. The 16 to 55 is what I use most often, and that still seems to have a little bit better optical quality for what we're capturing, but it's very close. It's very close. And if you're deciding between the two, I think it really comes down to if you're gonna prioritize quality and low light over functionality and just having a little bit more versatility in the field with this new 18 to 120. Fujifilm also introduced the XF 150 to 600, which has an equivalent focal range of 229 to 914. And you slap on a two times converter and you're looking at a reach of over 1800. This has stabilization built in. There are some great functionality and buttons on the lens itself to give you a great experience in the field. The, the dimensions of this lens don't change if you are zooming in, being able to maintain that center of gravity during operation. It's not nearly as heavy as it looks. And again, if you are going on a safari, on a, on a big hike of any kind, it's something that you can easily pack with you. That, you know, if you know you're gonna go after this place uh, for a specific kind of image, well, it's great to have this option now in the Fujifilm lineup of lenses. I don't know if this is gonna be as popular as some of their other options on the table, but I know there is this loud, minority of people clamoring for lenses like this. And I think they're gonna be very pleased when they start using it. That being said, we still have these lenses for a few weeks. So if you have any questions, let me know in the comments down below. I'll answer them there or in the upcoming review of the X-H2S camera. Before I wrap up this video, I gotta give a shout out to our sponsor and that is Moment. And you better believe you can find these new products at shopmoment.com. But not only that, while you're there, you can actually read my entire first impressions of the X-H2S. And while you're there, you can also check out their new filters and bags because they are knocking it out of the park lately. They've been a supporter of this channel for many, many years now. They are awesome. They really care about the creator space. And they are one of the few people that have a live chat option where you can go online talk to someone live and have your questions answered. And one thing I also appreciate, they don't shy away from criticism. So if you have issues with them, they, they will reply to you. They, they will see you in the DMs and in, in a nice way, in a nice way. Again, that's shopmoment.com. Thank you guys for sponsoring this video. And I think you guys will enjoy what they have to offer at, because I'm going to say it again, shopmoment.com. At $2,500, this is not an inexpensive camera. Uh, let's just get that out of the way but you are getting a lot of flagship value in this body. You know, you're getting a lot of features that are typically in products north of $2,500. So there is some inherent value there. It really comes back to if that value means anything to you and the work that you create. Apparently the S in X-H2S stands for speed or stack sensor. That's what they told us. Um, I have opinions when companies come out and there's this level of ambiguity to their branding. I'll save that for another video. Uh, but you see where Fujifilm is going with this and you, and you can appreciate it in the field. So marketing decisions aside, it, it's still an impressive product that delivers on that speed that makes you feel empowered to, to go out and create and capture and not be tampered down by artificial restrictions. Like I mentioned earlier and throughout this video, this is just sort of my first impressions using this across a ton of environments and locations and just pushing it as much as I could. 
I will address this and give more of my, my critical thoughts in the review and, and really going a little bit harder on some of these features. Anyway, if you made it this far, uh, First off, thank you so much. And, and number two, you would have noticed that I took a bit of a absence for the last two months uh, in uploading. This year, the goal is to only upload about 20 to 24 videos and just make them more dense, show a bit more of the journey and just, just pack in a ton of value as I focus more on developing my portfolio and doing more ambitious projects. So one, I hope you guys appreciate that. That being said, you can always follow me on Instagram and Twitter and, and communicate with me there. If you have any camera specific questions, keep them to the YouTube comments. Uh, but if you wanna see what I'm up to and what we're creating, follow me on social and connect with me there. I'd love to sort of continue this conversation beyond YouTube as well. Oh, and like I've been saying in, in every video uh, lately, uh, it's easy to get excited about new cameras and lenses and stuff. And you obviously feel that excitement when I'm talking about something like, like this, the X-H2S. I don't want to conflate that as, as a buying decision for, for you that are watching these videos. It's always important to be critical of your gear purchases and where you can invest in more in your craft and your workflow. Uh, understanding light and maybe even having more lighting options is always going to be more valuable than a brand new camera. So while these products are exciting, while we get to test them out, don't let that excitement fool you into thinking that you need this to create your best work. Always be critical of what your tools are and, and focus more on your creativity and your craft and developing that and, and to go beyond that, networking and finding the right people to collaborate with. That is always gonna be far more important than any new camera. So. Yeah, listen, I sound a bit preachy here and some of you might seem, you know, uh, ambivalent to that kind of stuff, but, but, but I wanna make a point of sharing this, you know, in every video possible. Focus on you, focus on your journey, focus on your craft, invest there, and everything else will fall into place. With all that said, as always, my name's Gadget. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.